Um, brilliant. Okay, so our next speaker is John Attridge, who's joining us today from the University of Surrey, where he's a PhD candidate in English literature. His research looks at representations of working class lives in the fiction of E.M. Forster, and his talk today is titled Edwardians in Crisis, Traversing Gendered and Sexual Boundaries in Forster's Short Fiction. So please welcome John. Thanks very much, Connor. There. Um, I'm just going to share my screen as well. Um, and yeah, can everyone see that? Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, I will also um, obviously be talking about Boundary Stay, uh, particularly in the short fiction um, of Ian Forster, who is widely considered an Edwardian writer. Um, he was born in 1879, but um, the majority of his fiction was published uh, during those nine years from 1901 to 1910. Um, his short fiction isn't as widely read as his novels. It often goes unnoticed in the criticism around Ian Forster, um, but sexual and gendered boundaries appear frequently and uh, certainly warrant further investigation in terms of how boundaries might be applied to the rest of his work. Um, so for many readers uh, and perhaps many of you here, the works of Ian Forster are kind of summed up in his epigraph to Howard's End, which is only connect. Um, an author of contrasts, uh, his novels that are pub were published during his lifetime often pit alternate outlooks against each other, often in a quest for some kind of compromise. These opposing outlooks usually emerge due to differences in class, gender or nationality, characteristics which for centuries had been strictly defined by society. Um, as the historian Leslie O'Hall asserts, it was only from the 1880s onwards that British society saw dramatic changes in sexual attitudes, social behaviour and gender relations that previously would have been unthinkable. So in his dissection of these alternate viewpoints, Forster's characters often challenge, pass through or attempt to redefine not just physical borders, but the social, cultural, material boundaries that defined the beginning of the Edwardian era. Late Victorian reforms in education, for instance, saw the emergence of a new reading public, which Forster depicts as craving access to middle-class cultural and literary spheres. Country, city and urban rural dichotomies in his works are also complicated by the establishment of suburbia. And concerns around nationhood, colonialism and empire are explored in novels and stories that stretch across multiple coastlines, seas and oceans and international time zones, particularly in his later work, A Passage to India. Perhaps most prominently, however, we see the author frequently abandoning the marriage plot of traditional romance fiction and upending conventional gender boundaries in a bid to assuage fears surrounding suffrage and sexuality that became more prominent during this time. Traversing boundaries and finding refuge in liminal space is therefore crucial to Foster's comprehension of these shifting Edwardian customs. Yet whilst the novels evoke that sincere plea for connection, which is so closely associated with the author's liberal humanist values, compromise often proves arduous to attain. And rarely does it result in a completely happy or optimist, optimistic conclusion for his characters. While some might find the lack of cohesive or stable resolutions to the novels antithetical to Forster's hopes for society at large, these ambiguous endings might nevertheless have been anticipated in some of this earlier short fiction, which we're going to be looking at today. In contrast to the later earnestness of the novels, Forster's fantastical short stories ad adopt a playful and often mischievous curiosity with the changing customs of the era, particularly in relation to gender and sexuality. Rather than demand or settle for compromise, characters in these stories often prove more self-assured, more confident and more determined than their novelistic counterparts. Forster depicts them as ecstatically and sometimes unapologetically passing through barriers, breaking down frontiers or crossing forbidden boundaries usually in a bid to escape gendered Victorian convention or to embrace the sexual unknown. So the first short story we're gonna be looking at is the story of a panic, which was first published in 1904. Set in the resort town of Ravello in Italy, it sees the adolescent and undisciplined Eustace, a boy who's on the threshold of sexual curiosity, respond to a moment of what might be described as collective hysteria rather differently to the rest of his company. Whilst the unnamed narrator confesses to being terribly frightened by the episode, Eustace appears to embrace the panic as an opportunity to deviate from social norms and behave somewhat unconventionally. 
following the incident, he's found rolling as a dog rolls in dirt and scurrying in front like a goat, even leaping right up into the arms of Gennaro, the Italian waiter, here breaking down barriers between nation and class as he does so. In fact, much of Eustace's so-called erratic behaviour is centred around defying the conventions of space. After jumping into the arms of his social inferior, Eustace paces outside the villa in the middle of the night, and later on, he's locked indoors. The boy is eventually rescued by Gennaro, and in an effort to escape, the pair jumped together from an um, upstairs window. As the narrator is, uh, observes, I reached the terrace just in time, to see Eustace jumping over the parapet of the garden wall, where he alighted an olive tree looking like a great white moth, and from the tree he slid onto the earth. As soon as his bare feet touched the clods of earth, he uttered a strange loud cry, such as I should not have thought a human voice could have produced, and disappeared among the trees below. Numerous critics have interpreted Eustace's behaviour as a metaphorical response to his burgeoning but ultimately, be, ultimately forbidden homosexual feelings. It appears Forster un unintentionally or unconsciously inscribed these within the character as he attempted to deal with the realisation that he too was unavoidably homosexual. This panic of the story then evokes the trial, the moral panic over homosexuality, sodomy and sexual inversion that succeeded the Oscar Wilde trials of the 1890s and in the shadow of which Forster would have grown up as an adolescent himself. The period saw draconian penalties issued to men who deviate from sexual norms and who were subsequently, subsequently transformed into social pariahs by the local community and the national press. For Forster and other Edwardian writers, to be a homosexual was to therefore be an unwanted outsider. Yet unlike Forster, who at the time of writing this story had yet to act upon his homosexual inclinations, Eustace's response to this panic instills him with the confidence to begin crossing social and physical boundaries. Boundaries which, for the author, are redolent of these restrictions placed uh, by Edwardian society on his own sexual desires. While the rest of the English company in the story dismiss Gennaro as little more than a poor Italian fisher boy, Eustace finds physical intimacy in the arms of the young and athletic Italian waiter, whose social inferiority now comes to parallel Eustace's own feelings of otherness among his assumedly heterosexual family and friends. Not content with simply satisfying forbidden sexual urges, Eustace even escapes from stifling Edwardian society altogether, jumping out of windows and over walls so that he might be among the great god Pan, whom he earlier saw in the woods and mountains of Ravello, but whom his fellow guests indignantly dismiss as dead. The Forster critic Glenn Cavaliero has pointed out the likelihood that Forster was influenced here by the Welsh author Arthur Macken, Whose, nove whose novella, The Great God Pan, invokes the ancient Greek deity as well, particularly so that sexual energies are portrayed as somewhat obscene and retrogressive. Prohibited sexual potential thus playfully lurks between Eustace's erratic breaking down of barriers in this short story. Whilst the remaining English guests are left stuck with a strange feeling of shame which they cannot openly mention to Eustace, and which itself acts as an allusion to the covert suspicions and unmentionable nature of homosexuality at the time, Eustace's newfound ability to traverse boundaries is framed by an optimistic, albeit slightly unsettling, conclusion. He clasped his hand over his breast to protect his ill-gotten gains, and as he did so, he swayed forward and fell upon his face on the path. He had not broken any limbs, and a leap like that would never kill and never have killed an Englishman, for the drop was not great. But those miserable Italians have no stamina. Signor Scafetti burst into screams at the sight of the dead body, and far down the valley towards the sea, there still resounded the shouts and laughter of the escaping boy. For Forster, breaking down barriers in this story is thus the only solution left to the social outcast who cannot, cannot help their inherent sexual nature. Uses is restricted quite uh, restricted and forcibly restrained by an unaccepting society. Rather than an attempt to explain or seek a compromise with his family, like many of the characters in Forster's novels, Eustace abandons them to go it alone, an unfortunate but ultimately liberating fate, liberating fate that, was that was attempted by not only the eponymous hero of Forster's posthumously published Morris, but by numerous homosexual writers of the time in search of physical intimacy. As uh, Wilfred Stone cannily asserts, 
Within the story of a panic, Forster therefore translates present oppressions into future delights, particularly in the crossing of boundaries. Some of Forster's other short stories have been similarly interpreted as advocating for sexual liberation and for the establishment of a secret or hidden world set apart from the Edwardian Britain, which, it, which would embrace and support shunned homosexuals. In the Celestial Omnibus, which was first published in 1908, for instance, the protagonist is an adolescent boy not unlike Eustace, and he too is unable to articulate his desires for something just a little different. These desires are described as running up and down inside him till he would feel quite unusual all over and as likely as not would want to cry. For the modern reader, it is difficult not to interpret such feelings as those consistent with the shame, fear and disquiet of being a closeted homosexual at the time Forster was writing. To cope with such de desires, the boy here eventually finds refuge in the titular, titular Celestial Omnibus, which he observes with somewhat guarded anticipation. Here the noise had died into the faintest murmur, beneath which another murmur grew, spreading stealthily, steadily, in a curve that widened but did not vary. And in widening curves, a rainbow was spreading from the horse's feet into the dissolving mists. The colour and the sound grew together. The rainbow spanned an enormous gulf. Clouds rushed under it and were pierced by it. And still it grew, reaching forward, conquering the darkness, until it touched something that seemed more solid than a cloud. Following this, the omnibus ascends to heaven where there is light upon the shores of darkness and which proves home to an array of Western literary and mythological characters from Achilles and Tom Jones to John Webster's The Duchess of Malfi. In abandoning, abandoning civilization and running up a blank alley so that he might escape social restrictions and live among fantasy, Forster's protagonist again crosses boundaries to gain a sense of fulfillment. And the, only this time the celestial boundary is between the suffocating physical world of Edwardian domesticity and the idyllic spiritual world of unfettered cultural imagination, which here functions as a substitute again for homosexual desires. While some critics have dismissed this celestial world as a mere parody of Christian heaven, Wilfred Stone again discerns how the ability to cross Forster's rainbow bridge is preserved only for those artists who are pure in, pure in heart and who erect no barriers against the imagination. This fight for individual freedoms, individual freedoms and for the right in particular to choose one's sexual partner is something Forster would continue to champion outside of his novels in later life particularly in his defense of Radcliffe Hall's lesbian novel, The Well of Loneliness, and as well as during, to, during his two stints as president for the National Council of Civil Liberties. Elsewhere in Forster's early short fiction, boundaries that cannot be fully crossed or surmounted are nevertheless subject to shifts and alterations that weaken their overall influence. So one of Forster's less celebrated short stories, Coordination, deals directly with the stifling conventions of an Edwardian girls' school in which the female teachers attempt to break free from its suffocating structure. The story relates how first a Miss Haddon and subsequently her principal become disillusioned with the monotonous routines and bureaucracy of day-to-day -day teaching. Initially, the female only faculty exclaimed how they love coordinating and that it was a lovely system, an attempt to teach the lives of the appointed great men of history, such as Beethoven and Napoleon, to their students. But in a moment of spiritual detection, Miss Haddon responds differently. She lifts, a, uh, she lifts a shell paperweight mechanically to her ear as her father had often done to her when she was young. She heard the sea. At first it was the tide whispering over mudflats or chattering against stones or the short crisp break of a wave on sand or the long echoing roar of a wave against rocks. Or when the air is so fresh that the big waves and the little waves that live in the big waves all sing for joy and send one another kisses of white foam. She heard them all, but in the end she heard the sea itself and she knew that it was hers forever. Immediately, Miss Haddon is imaginatively transported outside of the school grounds in a bid for liberation and here, Forster summons an exacting and invigorating, and invigorating contrast across multiple boundaries between interior and external spaces, between the domestic and the natural, and between the stuffy and the intimate. 
Realising the soul of the soul of the sea had returned to her, Miss Haddon immediately gives notice so that she might move to a cottage by the sea and escape the humdrum life of constant coordination. But her resignation has a knock-on effect, as the principal too recognises that within it a word of truth, and which appeals to her own latent need to, for escape from a system which she merely enacted because it was the type of thing that in Forster's story impresses the Board of Education. Invigorated by Miss Haddon's sudden whim, the teachers and pupils go out an immense distance into the country, away from the school and where they might play disorganised games and ever more refer to the coordination system with the derision that it deserves. The scenes of female liberation in this story seem quaint and innocuous when compared with the rallies, demonstrations and propaganda activity or any other causes for ag of agitation which propelled the Edwardian suffrage movement before the First World War. Forster, however, still champions the rights of these women to free themselves from the red tape and mismanagement of administrative affairs that are designed to turn out obedient but unimaginative women of a Victorian mould. Running parallel to the scenes at the girls' school are more moments of fantasy, once again set in an alternate heaven where history and myth collide. Here, the spirit of Beethoven watches over the women's attempts at education, and in the story's fantastical conclusion, the demon Mephistopheles approaches the angel Raphael, insisting that the discreditable, discreditable affair of the trip to the countryside proves how humanity lacks coordination, particularly in ways that connect the historical genius of men like Beethoven with the spirit of the ordinary man. Rather than admonish the teachers here, however, Forster has Raphael challenge Mephistopheles and assert that these people, Miss Haddon and the women, have indeed coordinated not via the studious critical efforts typical, typical of a scholarly masculinity, but by cross, crossing physical and social thresholds in an effort to reattune their material lives with their spiritual selves. Here, Forster expresses a preference for freedom through emphasizing genuine autonomy as existing across spatial, temporal and imaginative borders. Miss Haddon, for instance, transcends from the physical to the fanciful by using a seashell to reach back in time and access comforting childhood memories. The seashell being a natural fragment of the beach, which is itself um, a marker between the sea and the dry land. The principal too recognizes the possibility of freedom via a clear call through the thicket in her dreams. Another natural boundary that must be traversed before she can abandon her current position with the school. And while Forster certainly admired Beethoven as a listener during his lifetime, he surrounds this celestial version watching over the girls with mindless clerks who are depicted as busy entering all the references made on earth to their employer, but who as a group failed to recognize how the pupils were ultimately bored to tears inside the classroom, how they might in fact find more fulfillment in the great outdoors. The characters in coordination are therefore encouraged to continue avoiding compromise Primarily in, a bed, primarily in a bid to save their souls from the clutches of stifling and unimaginative Edwardian respectability. So according to biographers and critics, Forster himself was a writer often considered at the edge of things. And I've put up this slide here just so you can see how in Vanessa Bell's painting, The Memoir Club, he's quite literally put at the edge of the physical space. David Medley, uh, outlines this in particular, saying that Forster was associated with the Bloomsbury group, but he was not a central figure. And Peter Burrow too labels him an artist on the fringe of social reform. More recently, even Zadie Smith, uh, the popular novelist, has referred to Forster as an Edwardian among modernists. For critics such as Alex Werdlin, Forster's status as a peripheral and sexual outsider made him constantly aware of what is to be said on both sides of any question. And this kind of balanced outlook is something we see regularly in the novels. But in these short stories, we've seen how the author is capable of taking a much more partisan view on the necessity of escape from gendered and sexual convention. So how might we reconcile these two versions of Forster? So to conclude, it's notable that even in these short stories, which passionately champion personal liberty over Edwardian etiquette, the tale is nearly always told from either the perspective of a secondary unnamed character or an enlightened and omniscient narrator. Eustace's post-panic transformation, for instance, 
is only ever witnessed for the eyes of the elder man who finds the boy indescribably repellent and who revels in his own xenophobic behaviour. In a similar fashion, the final scenes of the cele celestial omnibus suddenly shift the story's focus from Forster's paradise of the imagination, which is untainted by oppressive Edwardian customs, and back to Edwardian England, where we read the obituary of Mr. Bonds in the Kingston Gazette, a neighbour whom the boy failed to carry over on the Rainbow Bridge with him on his final journey. These harsh and discordant reminders of an unaccepting reality anticipate the desire for reconciliation Forster would later imbue in his novel's protagonists and emphasises the, the degree to which, as an author, he too was hesitant to break down narratorial barriers, even in a bid to speak and live more freely. Second of all, whilst it does appear at first sight that these short story characters escape their fates, they actually remain uncertain. Consumed by his erratic desire for freedom, for instance, we might assume that Eustace simply ends up drown it, drowning just off the Amalfi coast after his escape. Or that the alley of the celestial omnibus signals not just the death of Mr. Bonds, but the death of the unnamed boy as well. And in coordination, we might believe that Miss Haddon, the principal, ultimately returned to the school after their unplanned excursion, ready to face reality the next day rather than the inevitable wrath of their students' parents and other reprimands from that board of education. Even accounting for these caveats, however, Forster's short stories, um, which he mostly wrote in his early career, vividly extol the need to traverse, alter or undermine Edwardian sexual and gendered barriers in a bid to resolve the anxieties many felt about the changing social mores of the era. In an increasingly complicated and populated world, old traditions and their corresponding boundaries no longer seem so resolute. Although he's aware of the potential pitfalls of change and often removes his authorial self at least one step from its corresponding implications, Forster's desire to deviate in these tales is palpable. The characters of the short stories explicitly, explicitly push for liberation, often with a tenacity, fearlessness and steadfast refusal to cooperate which for better or worse, the majority of the characters in his later fiction ultimately appear to lack. And that kind of concludes my explanation of boundaries in Forster's short stories. Thanks so much, John, for another, another fabulous talk. I haven't, uh, I haven't read that much Forster, but the quotes that you, that you gave us there really gave me an appetite uh, for it. I think I'll, I'll like, launch back in. I definitely want um, great white moth on a t-shirt, I think. That's a phrase for the ages. 